Thank you, Wendy. Um, hello. So yes, I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of uh, three data formats that are often used here at CEDA. Um, we refer to these as our preferred formats. That doesn't mean that it's only we as data scientists that prefer them. The formats that we choose here are widely used within the environmental science communities uh, that we serve. And the important thing about all of them is that they, they provide not only a convenient means of storing the data themselves, but also the in-file metadata that Wendy has spoken about so that the contents of the files can be correctly interpreted in the future. Now, when you're choosing a format uh, to store your data, the first thing that you have to think about is what are the data that you're trying to store? And this is a common sense uh, decision. So if you're dealing with large, multi-dimensional data sets, for example, if you've got a large amount of output from uh, a climate model or a numerical weather prediction model, then you would probably choose a binary data format, such as uh, NetCDF, that's commonly used here at CEDA. Whereas if you have a, a smaller data set, for example, a time series from a single observing station, or perhaps some simultaneous observations from a network of stations, the sort of thing that you might typically gather into an Excel spreadsheet uh, and, and just list some data values, then you would probably uh, look at using an ASCII data format. And I'll show a couple of examples of those. Uh, in, in this talk, says BAD CSV or NASA AMES formats, and I'll explain all of those as we go along. As we've already said, each data format comes with its own set of metadata conventions. So whichever format you choose, you need to follow the conventions for the metadata that go with that particular file format. And the important uh, thing about storing the metadata inside the file means that the metadata and the data can't accidentally become separated. So if the file is moved around in the file system or if it's copied from one medium to another, the metadata won't get lost and future users will still be able to understand the contents of your files. So let's move on and look at the, the first of the formats I mentioned. Uh, so CF, net CDF is quite a, a mouthful, but net CDF is a binary format for large multidimensional data sets. So it stands for Network Common Data Format. And this is the sort of format that you would choose if you've got large data sets such as climate model data or numerical weather prediction uh, data, perhaps even some satellite data sets, radar data and so on. So th these would be typically large data sets. Um, increasingly, NetCDF is also being used as a way of recording ob observations, uh, not just model data. The important thing about NetCDF as, as, a, as a binary format is that it's machine independent. So that means the data can be transferred and processed easily on different computer platforms. So the person reading the data doesn't have to worry about whether they've got exactly the same architecture on the inside of their machine as the person who wrote the data. That will all be handled transparently by the format and the library of routines that are used to access that. And the CF in the title stands for Climate Forecast Metadata Conventions. So this is an internationally agreed set of conventions for describing the contents of environmental data, particularly that stored in NetCDF format. So conceptually, what is inside a CF NetCDF file? Well, if you're thinking about how to store your data, then uh, a logical way to think about that is, is collecting the data together into particular geophysical types. So, for example, if you've got temperature data or humidity data, you'd want to store that together. And uh, in CF metadata, this is simply referred to as your uh, variable. So a variable would, for example, um, sea surface temperature, which is the SST uh, rectangle shown there. And probably, if, if, for example, if you have model data and it's a, a large uh, data set, something like sea surface temperature is a two-dimensional field of data. So it probably has some latitude and longitude values associated with it. On the other hand, if you have something like humidity data, that would probably be uh, at least three-dimensional. So you would have latitude, longitude and pressure, for example. And you may have further dimensions, so you may have a time dimension in your data. 
if you have something which is a, a radiation data set, for example, you may have a spectral dimension because you may have things recorded at different frequencies, for example. Um, the net CDF files allow up to a maximum of 32 dimensions for any particular variable, which is probably far more than anybody would need to use in practice. So it is a very flexible data format. And you need to, as well as knowing the, the number of, of dimensions of, of your variable, you also need to know what are the coordinate values. So, for example, if you wanted to plot your data on a map, you would need to know uh, the latitude and longitude values or the time values, for example, so that, so that you could plot that on your axes. And the way that that metadata is associated with the data in the file is using special one-dimensional variables called coordinate variables. And there's an example on the right hand of this slide of a, of a time coordinate variable. So it is literally just a one-dimensional list of numbers of the time values corresponding to your data. Also inside a NetCDF file, there's something called a dimension. And a dimension simply lists the size of each corresponding coordinate variable. So you might, for example, have 10 longitude and latitude values, five levels in the vertical, and uh, five or six uh, time steps. And so your dimensions say, how big are your coordinate variables? The coordinate variables say where your data points are located, and then the data themselves are stored in the data variables. But there's other information besides the, the very basic coordinate information that you might want to uh, attach to your data variables inside your NetCDF file. And we refer to these as attributes. So an attribute is simply a property of the data that you want to record inside the metadata for future use. And attributes really fall into two groups. So you can have a global attribute, and that is something, a piece of information that would apply to everything in the whole file. So for example, the name of the model used to generate the data, or the name of an instrument, the name of the person who generated the data set. On the other hand, there are specific pieces of metadata that you might want to attach to just one variable. So units of measure would be an example of that. And the slide here shows, for example, units of degrees Celsius for the temperature variable, whereas the RH, which is a relative humidity variable, uh, is simply a number recorded as a percentage. So you can put uh, properties like that and attach them to your data variables. Um, you can also attach something called a standard name to your variable, uh, so that no matter what you, you call the variable in your file, somebody else can recognise that when you said temp, what you actually meant was air temperature, for example. Okay, now you wouldn't usually print out the contents of an NetCDF file to your screen because these data files are very large, and as I said, they're a binary format. However, if you want to examine what's in your file in a human readable form, uh, there are software tools that will allow you to do that. And here is just a simple example uh, of, of a file that's been printed out in what we call a CDL notation, that's common data language. Uh, and this is usually how a NetCDF uh, file is, is displayed uh, if you print it to your screen. So in this particular example, there's just one data variable. It's called RH, and it has coordinate variables called LON and LAT associated with it, so that will probably be longitude and latitude values. And we can see that the dimensions tell us that there are three longitude values and eight latitude values. So that gives us the size and shape of our data variable. We've also associated a units attribute and a long name attribute uh, with, with a variable. There's a whole list of attributes that you could uh, attach to a variable. Those are described in the CF conventions documentation. And down at the bottom, you can see the data values themselves of RH have been printed out, so those are floating point numbers. Uh, the next slide I've included, this repeats essentially what I've just said, but if you're looking at these slides offline, it will remind you of the explanation that I've just given and what these numbers mean. Okay, so let's move on now to looking at a different data format. So BADC CSV is an, an ASCII file. So that means that it's a very portable format because you can open it in pretty much any text editor 
on any machine. So it's, it, again, it's easy to read no matter what computing platform you're working on. BADC stands for British Atmospheric Data Centre because this uh, particular format was designed here by scientists at CEDAR and the CSV stands for Comma Separated Values and we'll see why that is in a moment. So this particular format is mostly useful for 1D data so as I uh, said at the beginning something like a list of numbers, a time series for example from one instrument at one location the sort of thing that you could easily read and write in a spreadsheet tool such as Microsoft Excel. The metadata conventions for BADC CSV files are in fact based on the CF concepts that we've just looked at. And here's an example of what you might see inside uh, one of the files. So this is displayed as you would see it in a spreadsheet. So the first thing to note is that the, obviously there are coloured boxes here. So the red and the blue boxes at the top are delineating the metadata that go inside this file and the green box bottom shows the data values themselves. Now as with NetCDF and CF metadata, uh, BADC CSV files also have the concept of uh, global metadata attributes so again here, it might be the things like the title of your file, the name of the person who produced it, and so on. And they're indicated by a, a G in the second column. And again, you can also have variable attributes. And the way that you connect an attribute to the variable it's describing is to uh, use the column number. So for example, uh, the, the data in the first column uh, have, have a standard name of time and there's another piece of metadata which says what units the time is measured in. So it's measured in days since a particular start date. The data in column two are air temperature and so on. And then the data values themselves are delineated in a block with um, a line telling you where the data begins and ends. So that's a very simple format of data but just to convince you that that's an ASCII file or can be written out as an ASCII file. I have an example in the next slide so if you're on a, a Linux system you could say you could actually cat that file which just means print it out to the screen and indeed what you see is the, is the contents of the file listed on separate lines just as they were in the spreadsheet and as you can see that there are no spaces between the separate entries they are just separated by commas and the data again appear at the bottom. But this, this file can easily be read in and out of spreadsheets, uh, so it, it's a very convenient and easy format to use. There's just one other format that I want to talk about today. This is a, a, an older format called NASA Ames. Again, it's an ASCII data format, uh, and as the name suggests, it was developed by NASA at their Ames research station. Originally, it was designed for use with aircraft data. So if you've got an instrument of aircraft measuring various, for example, concentrations of atmospheric gases, uh, this is a format that is very useful. Again, primarily, it's most useful for one-dimensional data. If you try to use it for more, more than one dimension, the files tend to become rather confusing to look at. So at CEDAR, we don't recommend that you use it for more than 1D data. nasa has its own metadata conventions. And we'll just look at one example of the inside of a file here. Now, there's quite a lot of content on this slide, but the, the main point to take home is that, similar to a BAD CS, CSV file, um, there is a header section at the top, so that's all your metadata, and a data section at the bottom. Uh, this is an ASCII file, so you can look at it in a text editor. Uh, it's important to note this is not a comma-separated variable file, so it is a different format to BAD CSV. CSV and in some senses it's perhaps a, a, a freer format but it's important to remember that there are metadata conventions that go with NASA Ames so this isn't just a, a random collection of what somebody decided to write in the file um, there are rules that you need to follow when deciding what metadata to include. Now I've just talked about a few of the standard formats there are many others that are in use uh, within the environmental science communities so, for example, if you have some image data, it might be sensible to choose something like a JPEG 
or a PNG format. Uh, models, particularly operational models, may use something like grid format, um, or the Met Office, for example, use PP format for model data. HDF is a common format for the uh, Earth observation uh, community. So there are very many of these that, that you might choose uh, to use. The main message is to steer clear of proprietary formats and bespoke formats. And by that, I mean it's best not to use a format which requires a particular version or uh, from a, a software vendor um, or to design your own data format. Uh, you may know how to read and write your own files, but somebody else who's perhaps accessing them through the CEDAR archive wouldn't know if the uh, format was a non-standard one. If you think that in your project you're going to need to use a format that is not one of the ones that we list as our preferred formats, then you need to talk to CEDAR staff as early as possible in your project about that and discuss what formats you may be using. One advantage of choosing any of the formats that I've presented examples of is that there are checker tools available. They won't actually check your data and they won't quality control it, but what they will do is they will flag up any problems with your metadata. So for example, they will tell you if you've missed out an important piece of information or if you've included a value that doesn't uh, uh, comply with the metadata conventions. So there are a lot of benefits of choosing standard formats. The first is, apart from the checker tools, there are also usually many other existing software tools for working with those files, such as reading, writing, or when you get to analysing your data, if you want to plot the data or calculate statistics, for example. If you use a standard format, there will be standard tools available to work with it, and that can save you a lot of time in your project. And as we've already um, try to emphasise that following the metadata conventions means not only that your data can be catalogued and discovered and reused by other people, but it also means that the data contents can be correctly interpreted. And using standard formats mean that your data are much more likely to be future-proof and to be able to be read by other researchers uh, rather than using bespoke or proprietary formats. And on this slide, I've added in some links to uh, various help pages in the, uh, on the CEDAR website uh, to describe the list of file formats that we prefer people to use and to give uh, also some documentation on the three formats that I've talked about today. <laughs>